uh, just to sort of start us off uh, looking at what's uh, coming up for the week ahead. We're heading, we're getting into the sort of the very end of the 1970s and really focusing in on the 1980s for this week. And then next week we'll get to what the, the book refers to as the recent past and, and try to very quickly cover the 1990s and as much of the early 2000s as we can. Um, so for reading this week, um, we have, it looks like a lot, um, but a lot of them are from the reader, so they are pretty short. Um, just to give you a sense of the different voices uh, coming out of this time period. Uh, so we're gonna read uh, chapter 29 in the book, Triumph of the Right. I'm gonna ask you to watch uh, or read along um, with the, the main points of what became known as Jimmy Carter's uh, crisis of confidence speech. Sometimes this is referred to as the malaise speech, but there's a link to the, the video so you can watch it. Um, in total, it's about 30 minutes long uh, and was broadcast on all the major networks uh, when, it was, when it came out. There's also um, the main points of it are summarized uh, in the American Yop Reader, I think for chapter 28. So you can read that or watch it, whatever, whatever you would prefer. Um, we also have some reader selections from chapter 29's sort of companion uh, pieces. So um, <clears throat> looking at the culture wars, Jerry Falwell, um, very uh, conservative evangelical Christian speaking about what he referred to as the homosexual revolution in 1981. Um, you know, very strong, uh, religiously motivated um, backlash against uh, <clears throat> the gay liberation movement that we talked about last class and, and people coming out. Um, uh, statements from AIDS patients from 1983. Um, and we will, by the way, um, uh, so those are statements from patients saying, you know, per, not just speaking to Congress about their illness, but also um, about the stigma and um, the homophobic backlash that many people were receiving, a lot of, uh, of the prejudice that, that was experienced by many AIDS patients, regardless of their sexual orientation. Um, so that uh, is up there as well. Also look, um, uh, keep an eye out on the YouTube channel um, a bit uh, later in the week. We will have an extra sort of mini lecture just on the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, <clears throat> Pat Buchanan, another conservative um, pundit, speaking about the idea of the culture war um, in 1992. So this idea, um, similar to what I think a lot of us still feel is happening, where you sort of have um, two different, you know, left and right wings um, that are kind of talking past each other or really view um, view the country in fundamentally different ways. And this starts in the 1980s. A lot of the, the social and cultural anxiety are gonna sound, sound really familiar. Um, and then finally, Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition, uh, 1984. Um, and so sort of what the, what the liberal um, world is looking at a little more in the 1980s. So Jackson um, bringing together um, a political coalition that is multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, um, sort of embrace the diversity of the United States rather than try to create a new conformity. <clears throat> we have some other activities as well. So one of my favorite parts about getting to the late 1970s is Saturday Night Live exists. Uh, so we can talk about um, political satire, certainly political satire from a more liberal um, perspective. Uh, but there are three SNL videos, um, one um, from the Carter administration and two that are speaking about um, Ronald Reagan. Uh, so they're all between like five and eight minutes long, so it shouldn't be too much time. And there's a, a couple of uh, questions on a Google form for you to answer as well. So at your leisure, watch those. And just think about what sort of an exercise in thinking about what satire um, can tell us about um, sort of the, the, the politics and the cultural situation in a time period. So watch it as you would any sort of comedic commentary now. Uh, we also have our fourth forum, 
uh, again, on the text, on the primary sources, on the videos, anything that we've sort of assigned for this week that you'd like to ask a question about. Uh, those questions should be up by Wednesday. Um, this week by Drew, Blake, Dylan, Manuel, Lucy, Natalie, and Sam. Standard quiz. Uh, writing, your reflection revision is due Friday. Like That should be like the older or the, the previous reflection revision. Um, you can either provide me with a copy of the original and then your revised and an explanation of what you did, or you can do it in sort of like a track changes. Like you can cross out things you're removing, highlight things that you are adding. Um, a lot of people like that option as well. And again, just a short explanation of your choices. And you can choose any of the five reflections from this semester to revise. Um, I will hopefully plan to have your revision fives done by Wednesday. So that should give you time to revise if you really want to revisit your most recent reflection. And then we've got um, a bunch of extra credit as well for this week. Um, we're returning a couple different kind of themes. Um, so first Blade Runner, the final cut from 1982. Um, again, um, this is sort of an exercise in what does science fiction or how science fiction is presented? How does that uh, tell us about the 80s? Um, it might be fun to watch, particularly if you looked at uh, some of the Twilight Zone episodes from the 1960s and see what's different uh, about 20 years later. Um, <clears throat> uh, then we've got uh, Do the Right Thing from 1989. So one of uh, Spike Lee's, um, uh, not his first film, but sort of one of his earlier um, and really important um, films, uh, looking at life in Brooklyn in the late 1980s and the kind and particularly um, again, reflecting on um, <clears throat> what it was like to, to be in some of these neglected um, uh, cities, um, to be targets of uh, the increasing mass incarceration and the drug war uh, and racial tension in some of these neighborhoods. So that's all, all tied up uh, in 1989's Do the Right Thing. Also by, uh, by request, um, I'm happy to acquiesce, um, the new Hulu series, uh, Mrs. America, which re returns to this debate about the ERA. Um, Kate Blanchett uh, plays Phyllis Schlafly and in the uh, excerpts, it sounds like um, she's doing an excellent job, uh, as well as you know, presenting many of the feminist figures in the period as well. So looking at that, very culture wars -y debate over the Equal Rights Amendment on Hulu. And then lastly, um, another PBS American Experience, which airs tomorrow, so should be available to stream afterwards, um, The Man Who Tried to Feed the World. Um, so this is looking at early um, <clears throat> crop modification. Uh, so there was a, a concern, particularly peaking, um, first presented in the late 60s and peaking in the 1970s, that global population was going to outstrip the food supply um, to devastating effects. And they were already, they were arguing this was already becoming evident in places like India with a rapidly growing population um, and not enough food. Um, and one of the answers and why we why we are a planet of over 7 billion humans right now comes down to um, things like um, uh, crop modification and applying science and technology to the food supply to create um, modified organisms that can feed you. Um, and this started um, in, the, in, the, in the 80s. All right, so a brief introduction, um, as all of these have sort of, you know, just been setting up our week, uh, to the 1980s, to Ronald Reagan, the so-called Reagan Revolution, uh, and the culture wars of the 1980s. Um, so right before we get to that, I just want to um, look again briefly at, <clears throat> to look again briefly at what these supposed culture wars are protesting against. Like what is, 
what, did, what, um, what was going on that felt the need for this so-called, again, Reagan revolution, the conservative revolution. And we have to look to the crisis of the 1970s and, and reflect on that uh, to understand it. So starting, um, starting off with the energy crisis, um, and it's really hard. We've all, all of us have pr pretty much lived in a world where energy hasn't been truly crunched. Um, there have certainly been periods where, say, the, the price of gasoline gets um, uncomfortably high, but I, unless, unless a, a bunch of you are much older than I think you are, you probably haven't waited in line um, for gas um, or worried that there won't be heating fuel um, for your house um, because it's not there. Um, like this. Um, so it, it really is worth um, looking at these oil shocks, looking at this energy crisis, um, and a country that hadn't really been running efficiently um, on oil. Um, and we start to see some attempts at modifying how the United States is going to, um, is going to consume things, um, particularly energy. So 1979, for example, um, the White House installed, uh, Carter installed uh, solar panels on the White House. Um, I find this fascinating. It feels really early um, for solar panels. Um, and they weren't quite modern solar panels. This was not, you know, powering all the energy of, of the West Wing or something like that. These are hot water solar panels. But still, this is a, you know, a, a new technology. Um, uh, uh, providing this hot water and, and the White House attempting sort of to, to lead the way on a, a different kind of um, energy production. Uh, so would anyone be willing to just uh, uh, take a moment and read the speech bubble? So from this 1979 press conference commemorating the solar panels. Any initial thoughts about Carter's, Carter's plan to install these, these panels on the White House and what they might mean for generations down the road? Yeah, so there's some, there's certainly sort of the op, a more optimistic take on it where this is really representing an, an exciting change. Um, <clears throat> any other comments on the, anything else you would wanna note in that quote? Yeah, so there's concern about missing out. Um, and, you know, something that I think we, we don't hear as much anymore, um, but uh, even as late as sort of the mid, you know, 20 aughts, um, you heard a lot, this is worry about dependence on foreign oil. This, this is sort of a national security issue. Um, if our energy comes from somewhere else, which is sort of responsible for some of these shocks. So OPEC, the group of oil producing, uh, oil and petroleum producing countries, um, you know, uh, put an embargo, uh, you know, stop selling oil to the United States in the early 1970s, in part due to, you know, due to U.S. support for, for Israel. Um, there are other shocks later. Um, much of our oil in the 70s was coming from, for example, Iran. Um, that stopped after the Iranian Revolution. Um, so this, these sort of the, the um, Cold War politics of not exclusively, but particularly the Middle East um, was, was responsible for this, this instability and this worry about um, dependence. And there's a sort of idea of trying to to move away from it. So it kind of represents as well these sort of uncertain times of the late 1970s. Uh, just a quick uh, additional question. Anyone think that, anyone know if these uh, solar panels were still on the White House in the year 2000? 
Well, spoiler alert, they, they were not. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ronald, Ronald Reagan took them off um, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in 1981. So they weren't, they weren't there for very long. Um, and we'll talk about why that just, that, that view of the um, practical and modest solar panel became the sort of, you know, cultural symbol of this crisis of confidence um, that Carter discusses. So inflation recession damaged not only the economy, but the national morale. Um, we have the concern about energy. Um, and we have a different uh, response to the, to the world as well. So while something like the worry about foreign oil might seem kind of isolationist, um, <clears throat> Carter had a very different approach um, than some of his predecessors. So almost going, taking that sort of Nixon doctrine of de-escalation and pushing it even further. Um, under Carter, um, Carter's doctrine to um, pursue diplomacy and to take sort of a moral view um, on, um, on diplomacy. So to start cutting relationships with, um, with sort of friendly dictatorships. Uh, in particular. So they cut support um, to brutal dictatorships in South Korea and Argentina, um, uh, citing human rights abuses in those countries. So even though they were, uh, you know, sort of pro-US, pro-NATO, saying that, all right, but you are, you're being brutal to your own people, so we are not going to support you anymore. Um, <clears throat> Although some of this was limited, there were still sort of Cold War hawks that wanted this sort of us versus them design. So it didn't go quite as far um, as, as wanted, but still we have, a, and we have a few other um, sort of attempts to sort of walk back American hegemony and empire as well. Um, in 1979, the Carter administration nego negotiated the return of the Panama Canal Zone. So if you remember back um, in our American empire discussions that the United States ended up owning a strip of Panama indefinitely. Um, this, uh, uh, this ended in 1979 and, and the transition period of 20 years began. So starting 1979, the zone was jointly administered by the United States and the Panamanian government. And in 1999, uh, the, the canal zone was officially fully returned um, and is fully under, under the control of Panama. Um, other major uh, foreign policy advancements, uh, the Camp David Accords set up a peace, uh, set up a framework for peace between Israel, Egypt, and Palestinians. Um, uh, meetings between representatives of the, those groups happened at Camp David in Maryland. Um, between September 5th and September 17th in 1978, um, and ended a series of wars in the Middle East, um, particularly wars against sort of larger players. So Israel and Egypt, for example, had gone to war. Um, and at least, you know, from that point through to the recent past, uh, committed the United States uh, to helping broker a two-state solution to the Israeli and Palestinian crisis um, or debates so that there would be both an Israel and a Palestine going forward. Um, that has, that sort of peace um, in the region has continued to elude the world, um, but this was a really important step forward. Um, again, energy uh, concerns, um, <clears throat> Uh, dominated, um, particularly in cases where security was considered over human rights. So there were, because of the energy crisis, again, there is some arguably like hypocrisy. So you, you cut off tie, you, you cut off support to some place like South Korea, but you still support the, you know, brutal, sh you still pr pr support the Shah in Iran. And Iran becomes a really, um, uh, imp uh you know, uh, important um, problem um, for U.S. foreign policy. Um, 
Although, and also, uh, before we get to Iran, that the Carter Doctrine did also protect American interests from Soviet intervention, especially after the 1979 invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union. Uh, we did not get involved in Afghanistan directly yet, um, but the United States did um, fund, train, and arm anti-Soviet forces um, with American-made weapons, um, some of those who later became leaders of the Taliban. <clears throat> Meanwhile, um, Iran and the hostage crisis. So the United States had a history of supporting uh, the Pahlavi dynasty of two generations. Um, uh, the Shahs uh, are the leaders of Iran. Um, the Carters actually visited Iran in 79 um, and stayed with uh, the Shah sort of praised a lot of the um, sort of technological advancements of Iran um, in the mid 20th century. And, and from sort of some outside perspectives, Iran looked like a growing and modernizing Western country. Um, but like many, uh, you know, not in some ways, unlike the, not unlike the United States, um, there were powerful interest groups that were not happy with those advancements, with the advancing technologies, um, the change, um, changing economy, or uh, increased rights for women. Um, and also, not unlike the United States, they were not immune to the stag stagnating economy of the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> you combine this with a, um, an absolutist um, ruler and secret police force, and you are building um, widespread discontent about a, a, um, a country. So, uh, uh, so th this, these are sort of the various interest groups that are behind the initial Iranian revolution to overthrow the Shah. Some are coming at it from a more liberal perspective for democracy, others um, to replace the Shah with a, um, a what, what they view as a more Islamic uh, friendly government. So absolutism doesn't really have a place um, in, in Islam. There, there is more of a tradition of uh, limited, uh, limited monarchy um, and, and uh, more power for religious leaders. So you do have religious leaders sort of backing a revolution and overthrow of the Shah. Um, <clears throat> And, but a lot of this is also, you know, not unlike, say, Vietnam, there's a lot of anti-imperial feeling as well. In this case, the United States is seen as a sort of neo, you know, new model empire that's getting overly involved in Iran. Uh, and 52 Americans were at the U.S. Embassy held hostage for 444 days, starting in 1979. Um, in response to the fact that the deposed Shah was undergoing medical treatment in the United States for cancer. Um, so by sort of allowing him in, arguably this sort of sparked a very direct retaliation, although there was a lot of anti-American feeling already. Um, internal administration debates on diplomacy versus a rescue attempt existed. There was an actual rescue attempt in early 1980, um, which failed. Um, and the revolutionary Iranian government demanded the extradition of the Shah while the U.S. insisted on working through the U.N. Um, the event really monopolized uh, the American media, this sort of failure to either the, the failed, a failed rescue attempt, uh, the failure of diplomacy, um, really uh, just compounded and, and meant that, that Carter was not going to win re-election. Um, sort of the, after years of sort of stagflation, this crisis of confidence, uh, this is sort of the, the final straw and many people wanted something different, a uh, different attitude and a different sort of enthusiasm for the United States. Which brings us to the 1980s, um, which uh, I just want to acknowledge, I, you know, for a lot of us, the 80s are mediated or even dominated by pop culture rather than politics. There's even been sort of a, 
revival and in interest in the night in the eighties, things like film, uh, franchises like stranger things, um, or the Americans, which, um, sort of provide a, a pop culture fictionalized view of the period, um, reboots of classic 1980s films like the 2016 reboot of Ghostbusters. Um, and then of course, two of the probably most enduring um, 80s or 80s-ish uh, franchises, um, Indiana Jones films, the original three, which came out between 1981 and 1989. Um, and uh, the original Star Wars trilogy, 1977 uh, to 1983. Uh, this is also uh, the rise of, of pop music. Um, it, as we know it now, the creation of the music video, um, MTV, cable. Um, cable came in in the late 1970s. Um, MTV merged sort of cable and music as a sort of pop culture medium. Meanwhile, news also is going to cha start changing dramatically during this period um, with CNN. Uh, CNN was founded in 1980 and was the first 24-hour cable news network. And it's going to shift the way people uh, interact with news going forward as well. Um, so again, just sort of a, a highlight that this that the way people are consuming and responding to media is changing. Um, and some of the um, sort of style of pop culture is changing as well. Um, if any of you, I mean, anybody not seen ever either Indi any Indiana Jones films or any Star Wars films? Okay, so you're probably familiar with both of them. And, and they're both kind of, um, and I, I enjoy them very much. This is not a this is not a critique, but they're both, you know, fr they're franchises where you've got this sort of um, you do have a kind of sort of easy moral positivity. Uh, Indy is good. The Nazis are bad. Um, Luke Skywalker is the hero, and um, will defeat Darth Vader and the Emperor. So you kind of almost have this, um, a focus on, on simplicity um, and these simple narratives. Um, you also have a pretty, you have the beginning of sort of the, the echo of the baby boom starting as well with some of the later um, Gen Xers. So people born from the mid 1960s um, to about 1980. All right. We're not going to watch some pop culture right now, but we are going to listen to the first three and a half minutes of Ronald Reagan's inaugural address. Um, and I know you haven't listened to the Crisis of Confidence speech, but when you go back to listen to that, I'd like you to think about you know, how they compare. But we can even think about the quote from earlier about how, you know, what does Reagan begin his speech? How, what, is, what does the message sound like? Um, and you know, what might have been appealing about this Reagan revolution to voters in 1980. So I'm just going to play, again, just the first three and a half minutes of uh, his first inaugural address. And um, yeah, and then we'll sort of tackle these questions together. Senator Hatfield, Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. President, Vice President Bush, Vice President Mondale, Senator Baker, Speaker O'Neill, Reverend Mumaw, and my fellow citizens. To a few of us here today, this is a solemn and most momentous occasion. And yet in the history of our nation, it is a commonplace occurrence. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution routinely takes place as it has for almost two centuries and few of us stop to think how unique we really are. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. Mr. President, I want our fellow citizens to know how much you did to carry on this tradition. <laughs> 
by your gracious cooperation in the transition process, you have shown a watching world that we are a united people pledged to maintaining a political system which guarantees individual liberty to a greater degree than any other. And I thank you and your people for all your help in maintaining the continuity which is the bulwark of our republic. The business of our nation goes forward. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. It distorts our economic decisions, penalizes thrift, and crushes the struggling young and the fixed income elderly alike. It threatens to shatter the lives of millions of our people. Idle industries have cast workers into unemployment, human misery, and personal indignity. Those who do work are denied a fair return for their labor by a tax system which penalizes successful achievement and keeps us from maintaining full productivity. But great as our tax burden is, it has not kept pace with public spending. For decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. To continue this long trend is to guarantee tremendous social, cultural, political, and economic upheavals. You and I, as individuals, can, by borrowing, live beyond our means, but for only a limited period of time. Why, then, should we think that collectively, as a nation, we're not bound by that same limitation? We must act today in order to preserve tomorrow. And let there be no misunderstanding. We are going to begin to act beginning today. All right. Uh, so, impressions uh, on Reagan's speech. How, how does he begin? Um, what does his message seem to encapsulate? Yeah, absolutely. So he sort of starts with, um, he starts with American exceptionalism that, you know, this is a great country, we've got all this freedom, um, you know, sort of countering maybe some of the disillusionment of the previous decade. Um, you know, this isn't a president who's going to get on TV and say, you should really turn your thermostat down and wear a sweater. Um, uh, <laughs> Or at least that's sort of the, you know, there is this sort of feeling of confidence that a lot of people got from, from Reagan and his, and his speaking, um, and certainly trying to make problems sound like they are ordinary and manageable rather than, than a major crisis. Anything else anyone thought or, or noticed while listening to the speech? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Reaganomics usually refers to um, sometimes very closely related with the idea of trickle down economics. So he talks about um, tax burdens later on that like, or he meant that how, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not fair to sort of penalize successful people by taxing them a lot. Um, and the idea is that if you if you relieve the tax burdens on sort of corporations and wealthy individuals, then they'll like spend more of that money, and it will sort of trickle down into the economy and stop um, inflation. Um, this is sort of part of a, you know a main part of sort of the, the Reaganomics of sort of rewarding private enterprise. Um, interestingly, in the primary, his future Vice President George H.W. Bush did refer to this as voodoo economics and didn't really think this was a way that the economy worked. But um, nevertheless, it, this is what sort of carries on um, and what the Reagan era um, becomes known for, also sort of deregulations of, of Wall Street. So you start to get um, sort of booms on the stock market, um, although still not always necessarily 
uh, reaching all Americans. So we do have sort of the stock market turnaround um, as we head into the 1980s, um, but real wages stop increasing um, somewhere in the late 1970s and have been have still sort of stag wages have pretty much stagnated, um, meaning people sort of buying power. Um, but good, so yeah, so um, Reaganomics, uh, he also, you know, sort of talks about, you know, borrowing and spending that, you know, an individual can't just keep living on credit forever. The country shouldn't either. So he's, he's talking about uh, the national debt or the deficit um, and how that should be brought down. So he wants to reduce the deficit while also reducing taxes. Um, but also while increasing uh, military spending. So if that sounds like that's not going to work, um, it's right. He doesn't actually bring down the deficit, um, but he does talk about bringing down the deficit. All right, and I just want to finish up with a few minutes um, as uh, looking at what Reagan's coalition looks like. And it, it, it borrows from um, Republican support earlier in the 20th century, um, but also includes some new ideologies um, that come together in the 1980s. <clears throat> so one are social conservatives. We already talked about social conservatives a little bit, and you did your ERA project on one of the big social conservative uh, messages of the period. But again, this really combines um, sort of evangelical Christians, conservative Catholics, um, blue collar white voters, um, and anti-feminists um, <clears throat> under, under one banner. So this is sort of the, the cultural part of the new right um, that want to, that people who think that the rights revolution, that feminism, that um, uh, these things have gone sort of too far um, over the course of the, of, of the 20th century. Um, this is sort of phrased by um, televangelist Jerry Falwell and, and founder of Liberty University as the moral majority. So he creates this sort of PAC uh, in 1979. Um, so again, a lot of anti-abortion advocates, people who are really worried about the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. Those blue collar voters um, worry about being left behind with deindustrialization. Uh, and generally tended to support what were considered traditional family values. We also have what's referred to as uh, neoconservatives. Um, so this is sort of the intellectual swing of, of this period and, and <clears throat> thinking of themselves as, as, as neocons. Um, so weirdly, these are largely you know, younger people who want to sort of take on this conservative idea of a conservative mantle. Um, hence the new and conservative, even if those seem like technically they should be contradictory terms, um, new and, and, and stopping change. Um, <clears throat> these neoconservatives are not really focused on those religious or moral problems, although they're happy to sort of partner with those people um, in an electoral setting. Um, but they're really worried about the economy. They are disillusioned by the great society. They think that pro major government programs have not worked from the New Deal through, um, again, those pro anti-poverty programs, Medicare, Medicaid. They're worried about overregulation of the economy and industry, particularly responding to new regulatory agencies of the 1970s, like the EPA, um, and also uh, OSHA, Occupational Health and Safety. Um, I think that puts too um, heavy a burden on businesses, and that's what le that's what's you know hampering reducing profits or leading businesses to um, relocate to other countries. Many fall under sort of the libertarian um, banner as well. Um, so barring from sort of mid twentieth century ideas about you know individual liberties, <clears throat> um, and what and. But they're also more organized. Um, so there's a couple new forms of organization. Um, the beginning of think tanks like the Cato Institute, and the Heritage Foundation, um, which hired intellectuals to form policy documents that could then be given to grassroots, um, grassroots groups in various parts of the country. Um, 
<clears throat> there are, of course, also liberal think tanks, but the idea really started with this neoconservative group. And, and uh, again, certain publications are important as well to consolidate and share those ideas, uh, notably the Wall Street Journal um, and the public interest. So this is, this is a group that's particularly concerned with the economy and changing, um, really moving away from those more New Deal ideas about the economy. And then finally, um, we have the cold warriors, the people who really want to step away from the from sort of the Nixon doctrine or the Carter doctrine and bring back Cold War pressure um, to try to break the Soviet Union and end communism. Um, so we have a revival of very strong anti-communist feeling, a revival of tensions as well between the uh, in the early 80s between the United States and the USSR. Um, and this moves beyond containment. It's not enough um, in the mind of these folks to sort of keep communism where it is. They want to end it completely. Um, so this leads to an, an uptick in US interventions in those, and, and again, what's referred to as like the third world during this period, particularly Latin America, as you'll read with brands later this week. Um, a desire to revive the arms race, which is why that military spending ticks up. Um, and the idea that this spending would somehow outspend the Soviet Union and cripple them, destroy them economically. Some people argue that that worked. It's far more complicated than that, but there was a lot of economic pressure on the Soviet Union during this period, <clears throat> which we'll talk about next week. Um, again, pro inter intervention, including the photo here showing the uh, 1983 invasion of Granada. Um, and and this just as another note again this is not this sort of back push was not just um, an American phenomenon we also we have this image as well um, sort of classically showing Ronald Reagan with his British counterpart Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher um, who also was a very strong Cold Warrior um, so we have this sort of um, at least with the U.S. and the United Kingdom um, this increased effort um, to be more uh, aggressive in terms of the Cold War. All right, and that's it. Um, we are out of time for today. Um, again, look out, there will be two mini lectures this week, one on the HIV AIDS crisis uh, and the other on the war on drugs and the beginning of mass incarceration. <clears throat>